For far too long, Africa has lived through a history of slavery, theft, foreign rule, and the darkest place in human history that the world brought to her doorstep. 400 years later, Africa's curse have birthed a dynamic, onward, and rising people. Join the Inspire e-conference 2021 as great minds edify on the positioning of the new rising star. Starting on the 9th to the 14th of August, Africa, get ready. Yes, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the fifth day of Inspire Conference 2021. I would like to welcome all of you in a special way. My name is uh, David Muyinga, and I'll be moderating the session that starts today. But I would love to welcome all of you uh, in a special way to today. We have come through four powerful days uh, of great teachings that have uh, come from great people. And I'm sure most of us are inspired and we, uh, be, we have the energy um, to take us uh, forward. I would like to encourage you that um, if you have an experience to share about the past days that we have just come through, please go to the uh, chat section, put a comment there. Uh, if you are on YouTube, go under in the comment section and just leave a message there of what has impacted you um, what has uh, challenged you in this conference and, and the different things that, um, that you have learned. And also in, 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 in the chat as well, please feel free to tell us where you are dialing in from. We've had many people um, from all over Africa and all over the world joining us in this great initiative. And man, it has been an explosive conference. And we are still going through great days um, of celebration, great days of teachings that are going to impact us to impact nations as well. So please continue uh, 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 mentioning in the chat, I can see uh, Muhammad Ali from Tunisia is joining us uh, and, and uh, many other people from uh, Nigeria, from South Africa, even from the USA, everyone wants to um, hear about uh, what is next for Africa. How are we able to ignite um, Africa going forward and we are going to partner together to ensure that uh, we, are, we achieve um, this vision. Those joining us from Europe all the way from Germany, we can see you, uh, Patricia from uh, Uganda, uh, Rita from Uganda, Christine from Uganda, those from uh, Kenya as well. It's great to have you with us. Just keep uh, putting in the comments where you are dialing in from and let us know. Joseph from Kenya, we see you mm -hmm. and we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for joining us um, and, and everyone across the world. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm telling you, Inspire Conference 2021 has been amazing and it's even getting much, much better. Now, some of you might be joining us today for the first time and you are wondering, um, you know, how I've, I've missed the, 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 the past days that have uh, just transpired and how can I be able to take part in this? I'd just like to let you know that please do not be discouraged on all our social media platforms. If you go on YouTube, if you go on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, you will be able to access the recordings from these past days. So you will not miss anything. I also feel free to share the same uh, link to others so that they can be able to listen in as well. Some people might not have had the time, but if you share this link with them, they'll be able to uh, take part in this as well. And also some of us are out there and we are wondering, you know, when I'm attending the conference, my children are asking me, what about us? What are we going to do? I would like to tell you that tomorrow, uh, Saturday, we have Inspire Kids, which is going to be taking place. And I'm telling you, the kids and the children also need to be inspired and driven into um, the, the, the future that we are discussing for Africa. So everyone, please um, encourage if you have children, if you have uh, your little nieces and nephews, please send them some uh, internet data and get them online so they can attend tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. Inspire Kids uh, conference is also going to be uh, taking place as well. So please share, the, share the, the link with them. The link is going to be shared in the chat section, which will be used uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. for the children that will be uh, the, the, the section of the children that will be uh, organized uh, starting tomorrow. Um, I would also like to um, encourage us that even after this conference, we have, uh, after today's session, we have breakout rooms. And so the discussion doesn't have to stop 
uh, in the conference. Some questions might not be addressed. And so you might have a question that you would want to be addressed later on. And so please do not feel uh, shy to engage in these breakout rooms. They are for you. It's, it's an opening where uh, we can be able to um, engage more with the speakers and also discuss on the matters uh, beyond uh, the time that may allow for just our speakers to speak today. So ensure that you take part in the breakout rooms. The, 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 when when the, the sessions end after today, the, the links for the breakout rooms will be shared and then you can join those rooms and continue uh, the discussion um, today. So I would just like to encourage um, each one of you and welcome you uh, to this uh, Inspire conference on this Friday. You know, Fridays are a day when people let down, they let loose. And I'm telling you today is also a day when we are going to uh, have a great time and, and, and let loose by listening to great inspirational speakers. At the beginning of the week, we had a discussion on uh, a discussion that involved the economic sphere of Africa. Uh, it, it transitioned into discussing uh, matters or about the individuals. How can we be more creative? How can we uh, be able to uh, make new designs for things that 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 need to 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 for the future that we need to uh, make uh, going forward? And, all, and 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 discussions on health that we had yesterday, so that even as we are creative, our bodies uh, do not let us down. They are strong enough to take us in the future. Uh, for Africa. And uh, even through these discussions, we are, today we are going to have a great discussion, which is going to take into context um, the, the, the political, for example. You know, when we discuss the, the, the market and how we are able to make use of the market, how does good governance uh, help to push us uh, forward? How does good governance organize um, our African uh, e economies and states in a way that allows us to, to be able to live healthy, to be able to design uh, creatively and to do the different things that um, uh, we take, we, we want to take part in. And so today we'll be having a great discussion uh, from a great speaker as well and great speakers to come who will be tapping on these topics as well as tapping on topics to do with uh, finances uh, and, and, and other great things. So everyone that's joining in, please, you're welcome. Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Uganda, Germany, the USA, you are so welcome. From Dubai, you are so welcome to the conference. And today we'll have, we'll be starting with one of uh, an, an, an inspirational speaker that is going to help us to uh, uh, shed more light on, 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 on the question of governance in Africa. Um, there has been the narrative and, and also the facts that point to, the, to, to, to Africa having most the most poorest countries and Africa having very many corrupt um, regimes and governments. And we need to find out what role do we have to play as individuals? What do we have to do? Uh, what things can we uh, play in, in, in this process? Do we continue blaming our leaders? What can we do? You know, and why is good governance important for us? And to address this um, question, we are going to have um, one of, 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 of our great speakers who is going to speak to us today, and that is uh, Council Joy Medivo. And uh, Joy Medivo is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya of 19 years standing. She's an executive director of the East Africa Center for Law and Justice, uh, a position that she has held for the last 11 years. So previously, uh, Ms. Medivo was the executive director of the Christian Legal Education Aid and Research Kenya. Uh, the legal aid branch of the Kenya Christian Lawyers Fellowship. So prior to joining the civil service, Ms. Mediva worked with the Kenyan judiciary for six years, starting as a district magistrate, rising through the rank of senior resident magistrate before her resignation from public service. She currently serves on several boards, including the Evangelical Alliance of Kenya, uh, the Kenya Students Christian Fellowship, and the Deliverance Church International Council. So Ms. Mdivo is also a member of the Law Society of Kenya, where she previously served as a council member of the Law Society of Kenya Nairobi branch. She is a member of the Kenya Christian Professional Forum, the Kenya Christian Lawyers Fellowship. And she's also a politician, having started actively participating in national party politics in 2013, 
She is a seasoned political advisor and commentator on political matters in Kenya and on national television each week. So I must say, uh, it's a great honor to have uh, Councillor Joy Medivo with us. And, and I'm telling you, she's ready to inspire us and just open your minds to take this in. Uh, Councillor Joy Medivo, we are very uh, honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much, David, and hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. And I want to just start by saying thank you to all the participants who have logged in today. Uh, my name is Joy. My mother's name is Mama Joy. My father's name is Baba Joy. And they pass their love because today I'm here with them. Um, their house is closer to my office. And so this was the safest place to do this. But over and above that, I would like to thank all the organizers of the Inspire uh, Conference. This has been a conference that I have followed uh, through the years. And I am so privileged to be speaking with you tonight. So straight into the matter of the day, as you have heard, I'm one of those people who has a very interesting dichotomy, not even a dichotomy, a trichotomy, because I sit on the mountain of governance and I sit on this mountain of governance in the church, in the political space, as well as in leadership in, as a lawyer. I have been in spaces where I have had to exercise dominion as given to me by God and as given to me by law and by study and by various functions. And I have observed different things as I operate in these various systems. And just allow me a little bit of time to share with you some of what I have learned. I chose not to use slides today because I want us to have um, a tete a tete so that we can speak to each other and can feed into each other. However, I'll make a paper available that the organizers will be able to send to the registered emails of all the participants. So have no fear. If I make any references that escape you, do not worry. This will be remedied. So good governance. Let's just look at the, the dictionary meaning of it. So this is governance that is supposed to be inclusive, accountable. It's supposed to observe the rule of law. It is supposed to um, just generate a society that is beneficial to all. That's what many people think about when they think about good governance. But governance in and of itself, as was designed by God, from what we've even had through this week, God had intended for him to be in charge of his people, that governance was going to be exercised from him and not uh, other men lording it over other men. But we changed it and we decided, you know what, we're going to give ourselves an opportunity to be something else. We're going to imagine ourselves better. And so we decided we can do this ourselves. And we imposed government on ourselves that now other men are in charge of other men. Uh, David talked about the issues bedeviling Africa, and even in the intro, there's the issues about corruption and poverty and all this unexploited potential in Africa, wasted uh, resources and all these other things. We have had to deal with, with colonialization and all these other things that have sort of put us in this little box that has made us imagine that in Africa, our biggest, majorest problem is good governance. Allow me at this early stage of my presentation to just sort of turn your theology a little bit about it and tell you our problem is not really good governance. Our problem is that the way good governance has been described and um, packaged for Africa sometimes is not as beneficial as it could be. Allow me to expound on this a little bit. One of the things that I have learned in this space is that we are being uh, we are in a world where other people create a reality and come and talk to Africa as if they have tried it, they've ex experienced it, they have proved that it is good and now it is time to give it to us. Why am I speaking like this? I'm a human rights lawyer. That's my, most of my ex uh, expertise lies there. I will defend people's rights and I've done this for a long time with a lot of women figure. The time that I went to school, most of us lady lawyers ended up being feminists by force because you're in a space that was so male dominated that we felt we had a cause, we had a thing that we had to go through. And so human rights was a very um, easy progression for me. However, through the years I have learned that the human rights system that is developed largely by the United Nations is one of those things that has been used in the one hand trying to celebrate diversity but in the other hand, trying to create a homogeneity. So it's almost in terms of, if you don't do certain things in a certain way, then as 
uh, in terms of good governance, you are deemed to be a failure. Let's just step back in time a little bit. Once upon a time, we used to be in villages and we used to be people, families, family groups that used to live together. And then the white people came and they did what we were told is the scramble and the partition of Africa. And now we ended up with countries. So for example, Paul Wafula here, my brother, if it was before the scramble and the partition, probably he and I would be in what would be one country. But because of the scramble and the partition, there's an imaginary line between me and him, and now he's Ugandan and I am Kenyan. And we had to accept that as something. And now we've just come out of the Olympics and we were looking at some of the results and you're looking at names that won athletics in Kenya and the names that won athletics in Uganda. And clearly they're from the same family. But yet we had to accept that as, as something. Another thing that we have been told is that political freedom is like the zenith of all freedom. If you attain political freedom, you attain self-actualization, then you know what, you've, you've truly made it. Think about the Arab Spring and other popular uh, uprisings, the, the fight against apartheid. It is true, self-determination is one of those things that is an expression of emancipation and of freedom. But is it really the zenith of freedom? We are in Africa. Here people would give their freedom for a plate of food. We have people who would give their freedom for just the stability of knowing that their children will be safe and they'll wake up tomorrow and they'll not be killed through war through the night. For people to know that there'll be no drought. There are some things that are so basic that honestly, if you think about it, political freedom is not the be all and end all. Kenya is preparing for uh, elections next year. And yesterday I was watching the news and they were saying, our elections are some of the, the most expensive in the world. Our ballot papers have got nine security features. That's even more than we have on currency because we want credible elections as if they should cost anything and everything. A fallacy? Think about it. Good governance, we've been told in terms of good governance is where we defend the rights of the individuals. Again, as I said, some of these things are born in the United Nations. And what I have observed is something I call ideological colonization, where you have a situation, if you try to say, you know what, that doesn't make sense to me, you are deemed to be retrogressive, anti-reformist, backwards, words like repugnant, that are used sometimes to almost shame Africa into imagining that we are a lesser child who has to keep learning from our big brothers across the pond. I'm not trying to engage in a, a hate match with, uh, with the Europeans or what. No, this is Africa's time. This is Africa's time. One of the points that I have written down here is I'm so tired of hearing Africa is rising. Forget it, Africa is not rising, we are risen. People, let us just accept the fact that you know what? Everything that we could have been taught, we have been taught. The rest of it, now we can start thinking. Even our children, we raise them until they're 18 years old. After that, we emancipate their minds, we let them make their mistakes, make, let them make their decisions, because at that time it's really for them to. And I think in terms of good governance, as Africans, we have reached that point. I have read a book recently that has proved to be um, a mind changer for me. It's one of those books that you pick up and it helps clarify many things. It's by an author called Dale Mast. Dale Mast, that's D-A-L-E, Mast is M-A-S-T, because I'm of a certain term, so I might say something and it doesn't sound like the real thing. So it's Dale Mast. He's written a book called, And David Perceived That He Was King. So this book is drawn from uh, 2 Samuel 5.12. And it talks about how David did not come into his own as king until he understood that he was king. When David went to fight Goliath, if you remember the story in 1 Samuel, he asked on three different occasions, what will be done to the man who wins uh, this battle with Goliath? And he was told, oh, the king's daughter, his family won't pay taxes, etc., etc. And David went ahead and defeated Goliath. And what happened is that when it came time for him to be given a wife, Saul changed the script and said, you know what, uh, I'll not give you this one. I'll give you another one. So the lady was promised to him initially, he did not receive, because one of the things David said to Saul was, I actually don't deserve to be your son-in-law. And Saul said, oh, if you don't deserve to be my son-in-law, then go ahead, he married her off to somebody else. Then later he changed his mind and decided, I gave away Merab, but let me give him a cow. 
So when he goes to get Michal, again, David does the same thing and says, oh, I don't deserve to be your son-in-law. And so this time Saul says, you know what, if you want her, forget about the fact that I have promised that she was going to be your wife. Give me the four skins of a hundred Philistines. What does David do? He goes out with his men and then come back with a hundred foreskins. He comes back with 200 foreskins. Yet she was his right, for lack of a better word. He went on and uh, his journey, you know, with Saul and eventually he was crowned king. He sat on the throne for 40 good years before this scripture that says, and David perceived that he was king. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I put to you is a problem with Africa. We have not understood our place at the table. Africa is at a place where right now we have the best of both worlds. We have enough learning from modernity to be able to understand the trends of the world. And this week we have, been, we have had a discussion about that information technology, where the world is going, the emerging trends, the study of just how the society is changing, how the workforce is changing. And that has been a feast this week. But we also have one leg back still in our past where we still have our culture. We have our spirituality. We still have that alternative world very much alive in our psyche. We also have the benefit of learning from others. I was told when I was growing up that experience is the best teacher. Well, the thing that we also know is that it doesn't have to be your own experience. You can choose to learn from other people's successes and failures and forge your way ahead. One thing we have been told, and as I said earlier about a political governance, is that we were told that the legitimacy of a leader comes from the legitimacy of the vote. I put it to you that a time has come, and Dr. Magara talked about this, where the legitimacy of a leader has to come from something other than the vote. We have to look at values and character. And this is where kingdom uh, individuals now become very powerful because we as being citizens of the kingdom of God and being citizens of our countries can draw our values and culture from the citizen of the citizenry of the kingdom and translate that into the citizenry of the world. There's been a huge uh, misnomer with how we do our theology because we keep imagining that the minister is the person who's walking on the pulpit preaching to us. I put it to you, according to the kingdom of God, it is the opposite. The ministers are the people who are sitting in the pews. And with that critical mass, if our teaching and our leading is right, then those people have the potential to become the critical mass that we need to change the needle when it comes to good governance. What do I mean? If you have men who, not for the fear of, of prison, not for the fear of man, are honest, are full of integrity, they're upright, they fear God, they do not fear man, and they work out of diligence and competence. Imagine what a world that would be. The Bible tells us when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Look at the study of the book of Daniel. It tells us that these young men are in captivity, they're in slavery. However, they had their identity so settled that even when they were in slavery, they knew exactly who they were. It did not face them. It did not make them bow. And that is the place I'm excited to see with Africa. That's where we are right now. We've reached a place where we can push back. We can say no. We can say there's a different alternative. And as citizens of the kingdom, we are best placed to take that position. We are best placed to take that stance. I know when you talk about good governance, we'll want to criticize the usual things. Oh, it must be corruption, it is tribalism, it is um, this and that. But I put it to you, if the citizens of the kingdom translate kingdom values into the marketplace, into governance, like the three Hebrew boys, when it comes to telling the Kadneza we are not careful, we'll be happy to do it. And we are going to be very powerful governors. And this is something that I wish all of us would take to heart. Now, one of the things that we also realize that we have been taught and we have adopted is that politics has to be monetized. We have to spend money to get into leadership. We have to spend money to get into power. It was very interesting watching the, the elections, the campaigns and the elections in the United States. And one of the, the incidences that stood out for me is a time when President Trump had a rally and you know them, they do this thing of issuing tickets. And um, 
the, the event was sold out, but when it turned up for the rally, the barely, you know, there was a handful of participants. And it turns out that this TikTok generation people went and bought all the tickets and sort of just showed him, you know what, they didn't turn up and the event was a flop. And they did the same thing to his daughter. Um, let me just use the Trumps as an example because it's the quickest thing I can think of. Um, uh, his daughter also had a clothing line and she was trying to do business online. And the TikTok generation, again, they did this thing where they would go into the online stores, they would buy all this stuff, put it in the cart and they don't check out. So once you put it in the cart, it's unavailable in inventory. But if you don't check out, you don't pay for it. So she was seeing stuff flying off the shelves and she's, she's so happy with business, but there's no money coming in. Eventually she had to close down that line. What am I saying? I'm saying that it is possible to push back against monetizing our politics. And the way to do that is not uh, beyond our imagination. It's simply to support good men and women who stand up. Kingdom citizens have been a bit afraid of wading into the world of governance because it is a murky world, it's a, it's a different world. However, when they do, if they do, we can be the people who support the change in trajectory in changing this culture of using money as a manipulating tool. In Kenya right now, there's a debate about campaign spending. And when you listen to the campaign, uh, the, the, the members of parliament and the other politicians saying, we have to take care of the needs of our people when we are campaigning. When they come, they expect us to take care of them. And once they get into power, guess who they take care of? That's the time they take care of themselves. We have to get to a place where that level of manipulation is removed. It's something that we were taught and it's something that we have to push back on. I don't want to be caught up with time. Let me move on a little bit. Again, I have just uh, come back from a, a summit where we talk about religious freedom. And the thing that struck me is that this religious freedom a summit had Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, Satanists. We had people from all major world religions and fringe religions and people who are not really religious, but they were in belief groups that all felt oppressed. And that made me wonder, what's wrong with this picture? It's because we're in a place where there's a lot more humanism being pushed. There's a lot more materialism being pushed rather than altruism. We're in a space where actually the space is shrinking when it comes to mindset, how to think. And so people of belief are the first victims because our belief systems are a little bit off the beaten track. Africa has an opportunity to redefine what we mean by human rights. The words that are used to describe human rights, inclusivity, equality, I will tell you for a fact, they don't mean what they mean in English. So if you talk about inclusivity, I'd be thinking about getting everybody involved and everybody included and everybody around the table. But in some social circles and in some uh, political circles, inclusivity can be used to mean you must open the door to people who don't uh, exactly think like you, but you must have them at the table with you, even at the expense of you having to deny what you believe is true. Same thing with equality. So we have to come to a place where we said, okay, you guys can have it mean what it means to you, but let us take time to redefine what it means to us. Why? It's because we have also to get to a place where we don't make our bio their bio. What do I mean by that? I have witnessed firsthand how much hate and angst comes from this insisting on my position or that position. So for example, let's look at this um, sexual orientation discussion in the human rights space. You find a place it becomes a political issue. It's a social issue, but it becomes a political issue. In Africa, such things are not yet a problem. We need to keep it that way. We need to say, you know what, you guys can mean what you mean over there, but over here, and that's why like President Museveni and even our president who says, you know, some of these things for us, they're non issues. We as Africans need to start defining for ourselves what we imagine and what we believe is our human rights, how we embrace it, and we protect that space jealously. Political freedom, being the zenith of all freedom, for a long time has also been used as a means of manipulating Africa. It has been used as a means of also getting us to forget that sometimes it is not up to us to chart our future, it's up to the future generations to decide how they will be led. And this comes to my next point about how to develop good governance in Africa. One thing, let's start them early. Leadership is as much a function of nurture as it is of nature. 
And we have learned actually through the years that even when nature does not lend you to a lot of leadership, you can be mentored and you can be grown into becoming the leader that you need to be. So let's start them early. I studied the life of uh, the Jews and I realized that one of the things that they do is that by the time a, a boy is 12, he already has an apprenticeship. So in, a, in addition to whatever other learning that he's doing, he's actually learning a skill with his hands. Why is this important? In this day and age, our education system, and we've talked about it this week as well, but education systems are such that we emphasize a lot of book learning and we have forgotten how to work with our hands. I mean, when Dr. Ivy was talking about how she's been through five plumbers in one year, I, I, I was sitting there saying, amen, because I'm in a space where I cannot find a plumber who will solve my problems. All of them seem to throw silicon at everything. I cannot find an electrician who will sort out some issues once and for all. I'll keep needing to call him every time and time again. We need to teach our children the value of working with their hands. But when it comes to leadership as well, we need to start drilling in them early that you are tomorrow's leader. And so because you're tomorrow's leader, we start the preparation today. In the movie, The Lion King, there's this scene where the young, the young lion, Simba, goes into the den of the hyenas. And he knows that he is king. Eh? So it's like David, he, had, he may have perceived that he was going to be king one day, but he was not yet there. He was not yet mature. He had not yet gone through the process. And so when the hyena starts circling and coming around him, he decided he's going to roar. And he let out a little, Wah! and of course the hyenas looked and they just laughed and like, ah, is that a roar? And he started getting a bit upset. So he tried again. And again, it just came out a little, Wah! And the hyenas now, they just knew, ah, this one, we're going to make a meal of him. And Simba decided to try one last time. And he took a deep breath and he opened his mouth. And what came out was a loud roar. And the hyenas fell back. And beknownst to Simba, when he had started wandering off, Mufasa came looking for him. And when he found him in that space, and when he opened his mouth for that last roar, it wasn't Simba's little roar that came out. It was Mufasa's big roar that came out. We have to teach our children. We have to mentor them. We have to move them forward so that they can become the Mufasa's of tomorrow. But they can only do that if we allow them to ride on our wings. We've talked this week about how much, we, how many um, opportunities are available to older people and the young people are left without jobs. I think the numbers are like 50% without work. But time has come for us to teach them to work with their hands, but at the same time for the Mufasas to stand behind the Simbas and propel them, mentor them, push them, raise them. And that's why I'm very glad that the organizers have done Inspire for us adults, but have taught to do Inspire for kids. And I'm part of the mentorship program where we do Inspire mentorship for the young adults and the young upcoming professionals. We have to be deliberate as kingdom people to produce the kind of leaders that we want. Invest in them early. So by the time they're running for office, you have put in 20 years investment in this person. They will be the kind of leader you expect them to be. But if we play it the way the world plays it, you wait for a person, you look for money, go and sponsor his campaign so that he can pay you back when he goes in. We perpetuate the, the old system. There's some very interesting facts that I came across. Africa's landmass, of course, is we are the second largest continent in terms of landmass. Asia is the first. However, Asia has 62% of the world's population. We have just about 15, maybe 16% of the world's population with almost twice the landmass. Yesterday, I listened to one of the doctors talking about how the soil in Uganda has over 10 minerals found on the periodic table buried in her soil. So it can produce food, but it can be mined for so much more. That's the potential that is Africa. And this is a pet subject for me. Our youth bulge right now is an opportunity, yes, but we have yet another opportunity. The most valuable resource on God's green earth is human resource. But we have largely unexploited this resource because we have been told that we are congested. But who is going to complain about uh, congestion. I mean, if, if I'm living, I mean, I, I, I live near Kibera. Kibera has the reputation of being the largest slum in Africa. If somebody tells me the world is overpopulated and we should have less children, I'll believe it because I'm in a 10 by 10 house with my neighbor right across the door. If he opens his door, I cannot open mine. 
I will believe that the world is overpopulated. Why is it overpopulated? Because we were sold this idea that we must all flock back into the city. We must all look for work in the industries. And so we have fled from the spacious outdoors of, of the village and we have come here. That's why this week is very important. What Dr. Laban Jumbo was talking about the other day, saying, you know what time has come for us at forming model communities. We need to move back to those villages and set up the modern amenities there. But over and above that, we need to understand that Africa not only has the world's most arable land, the world's most arable land, not only has the world's richest deposits, we have the potential to produce the people to run the 21st, the 22nd century. Why am I saying this? There's a research that um, was conducted and it says by the turn of the century, by the time we hit the year 2100, all the continents in the world will be experiencing negative population growth. The women there will be having 1.9 children or less per family, all except for Africa. We will still be having positive population growth. What does that mean? It means that in other continents, more people will be dying that will be, than will be getting born. That means eventually there'll be more Africans on the earth than anybody else. You see what I mean? Africa has risen. We need to understand that our human resource right now is getting more skilled. It's getting sharper. The reason why China is a superpower today is because they are the only country in the world that can raise a million man army. People equals power. China has veto power on the Security Council simply because of that. Even though the human rights is atrocious and it's actually a developing country. China is not even considered a developed country. It's a developing country. But people, the sheer force of the numbers of the Chinese people is enough to give them a seat on the world table. We have kept being treated to second-rate citizenry in terms of the world powers because we are perceived to be the dark continent. Well, guess what? That's about to change. We need to start training the next generation of leaders. We need to talk to our women in a way that will help them appreciate the fact that Raising children is actually a privilege. It is a calling. It is something that is wonderful. Let's not buy into the mindset that we are seeing in the West where it is almost an inconvenience to have children. Why? Because people are the world's greatest resource. If there's anything the corona pandemic has taught us is that human life is so fragile. Just like that, it can be gone. We can never have too many people. And why am I preaching this? Is because it was in tandem with what God told us when he created us. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Good governance is demanded of people when people actually exist to be led. And the church has an opportunity to lead and help people in this area because we can have good teaching, good standing, strong families, strong families as the basis of strong societies, those strong families raising people who become strong leaders because they're correctly mentored, they're correctly taught. And by the time we release them into the market, they're the right type of leadership that we need. Now, when we talk about kingdom, 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 there's one last aspect about kingdom that I need to just speak about. Kingdom wisdom. One thing that stood out for me when I was studying the life of Daniel, of Joseph, of Moses, is that they had the learning of the world. Moses was skilled in everything that the Egyptians knew about governance. And that is something that he was taught thoroughly because then he was gonna be the next Pharaoh. They tell us about the three Hebrew boys that they also were royalty. Before they even became slaves, they were royalty. The Bible also adds that they were handsome. So that also helps some. So they were royalty, they were handsome, but there was something else. They had high aptitude. And before they were used in the Babylonian kingdom, they were schooled and they were taught and they were examined and they were found to be 10 times better. Joseph, when he stood before Pharaoh and gave him the solution of what he was going to do with his dream, what did the Pharaoh remark? He remarked and said, where else can we find a man such as this upon whom God's wisdom rests? Competence. Competence is a function of good governance. For a long time, we have sacrificed competence on the altar of spirituality, sometimes on the altar of pursuing careers and imagining that we are better off doing something else. And I think it was Dr. Jumba who said, by the way, 
he realized that intercessors always stay in the prayer closet, but God wants them to be front line and center in the rebuilding of the walls, in the rebuilding of the cities. If we are talking kingdom, we have to get to a place where we take the words of the Bible, take the principles we glean from the Bible, package them in a way that makes sense to offer solutions to the world today. I was listening to Dr. Anand. I'm calling everybody doctor because I'm not too sure who was doctor and who was not. But I was listening to Dr. Anand and he was talking about how the workforce is changing, how the demands even for, for what skills, how the world is changing. We are the people who are going to have enough population to be able to put those emerging trends into, into a reality. It's coming in 2025, but in Africa, this can come even sooner. Innovation is something that we have never harnessed completely because for a long time, we've been happy to be net consumers. But the coronavirus again taught me something. This vaccine appetite that we have seen, where people vaccinate themselves first, and even where they're vaccinated, they hoard all these other vaccines. And only after they think maybe they're a little bit guilty, they release some to you. Yet you have enough doctors to be able to come with that vaccine yourself to produce your own, but no, they hold the intellectual property. And I listened to our president Kenyatta saying, when Oxford was developing the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, they were happy to work with Kenry. When they were done working with Kemri, it was they who made the decision to award the contract to produce the COVAX vaccine, to produce the AstraZeneca vaccine in India, and they awarded the contract. But now that India has gone ahead and produced the, the, the vaccine for the African market, they come and say it's not good enough and they won't recognize it. Bob Marley is on the sun and said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. It is time for us to use kingdom principles and kingdom learning to offer solutions to the world and to refuse to be pigeonholed into people who always have to use other people's um, solutions for our problems. Why am I saying this? It's because the Bible tells us if you lack wisdom, ask of God and he will give it to you. We are in a place where we've got enough young people to innovate. We've got enough young, we don't need to create a new car, it's been created. We don't need to create a new, it's everything that needs to be created has been created. But we need to get to a place where what has been created must be innovated. We need to start making solutions that work for us. And one of the ways that I believe we can do this is by employing God's wisdom to common parlance. David Oliver is a man that I love and respect. He's one of the elders in, in a church in Basingstoke, or used to be an elder anyway. And one of the things that he, he has used his life to demonstrate is how work is worship. And he's a very successful businessman, much sought after speaker and trainer. He's a coach of businesses. And he says that everything he teaches people on how to elevate their businesses, he actually learns from the Bible. He doesn't go and quote the Bible, but he'll tell them, for you to be able to do this, it will be like Joseph. You have to lay up in the years of plenty and spend in the years of leaning and lay up in the, and those principles he gleans from the Bible. That's what we need to do. Using kingdom principles, to impact the world. I need to start wrapping this up because I can see the, the sign that I have, I'm almost done. And allow me to just put one last point across. In this entire uh, talk, when we talk about good governance, we have to look at something that I call the what if factor. What if we did not demand to have our own king? What if we allowed God to actually be in charge of the world? What if? We were not in charge ourselves and the devil was not in charge and it was God who was in charge. And I like being in that space for one major reason because it helps me to pivot back as a believer. So I'm a politician. We were having a discussion with Paul just before the conference because last year my bio said I'm a reluctant politician. And God through the last one year has told me what, what, what's with you and this reluctant politician thing. I opened space for you in this in this area, and I have planted you there as my planting, why are you still reluctant? And so out of obedience, I have now accepted that I'm actually firmly a politician, but that I'm also still a planting of the Lord. And I asked the Lord, okay, so what if you were in charge of us? What would that look like? And he told me, look, Joy, when the, world, when the word says that the kingdoms of our Lord have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, it means exactly that. Why? It's because the kingdom of God is here. It is called joy, Brenda Masinde Mudivo. This is the kingdom of God. 
You are the kingdom of God, wherever you are. And every time you walk into a space and, you manif and you're standing there, the manifest presence of God is with you. So the challenge then to you becomes, let your kingdom come, let your will be done right here, right now in me as it is in heaven. What if God was truly in charge? Guess what? He is. And he's in charge in you and in me. We can look at good governance as what is our government doing? The government should do this. The government should do that. Guess what? Government sits there and they make whatever policies they make. But it is civil servants who implement those policies. Those policies are cascaded to parastatals and other organizations. Then it comes to civil society. Then it comes to the regular citizen. All of us are part of this governance. If we really want to see what governance was supposed to be like under God, guess what? The man in the mirror, that's where you need to start. My challenge to you today is as you leave this conference, all the wisdom that we have gleaned through this week, all the men and women of God who have poured into us and what they have spoken with us has to change how you do your job, has to change how you do your work. Yesterday, Dr. Vaughan gave a, a very, oh, it was such a powerful example of this person who listened to her five principles and he was being fired from work and he said, you know what, I'll apply the five principles. I forget them, so let me not try and uh, attempt. I forget all five, but one of them was perseverance and doing the correct thing. And so even on his last day at work, he persevered, he did the correct thing, finished this project that only he could finish. And he went ahead and put in the work even beyond the office hours. And he had been fired and it was his last day. And he put in his last assignment with excellence and he walked away. Two weeks later, they had to call him back. Why? Because he, he had displayed rare quality. That is how good governance in, in the world, is, in Africa actually, is going to be achieved. It's by men and women excelling where God has planted them. And the best example of this that I can think of is Daniel. Daniel served for administration in the Babylonian empire. And even when one tried not to include him, he suffered such disaster that his mother came and told him, look, there's a guy called Daniel that your father leaned on. You need to go get him. That is the quality and the value that you can have. You may never be king. You may never be president. You may never be a leader, but guess what? You can be the man upon whom the king will lean. You can be the Nehemiah who can stand there and tell the king, the city lies in ruins. Can I go rebuild it? You can be like David, just delivering food to your brothers. And then you hear Goliath and you say, who's this that defies the armies of Israel? Do you know that even when David was going to deliver the food to his brothers, the Bible actually records that he found someone to leave the sheep with. Except being who God has called you to be and being faithful in what he has called you to do. We have to be that people. We want good governance. We are the ones who can do good governance. And when you recognize that you are the kingdom of God and everywhere you walk you're in the manifest presence of God, then you're able to put out what God wants to be put out. Very last example from my life. You've heard that I do political commenting on, you know, those talking heads that know everything about politics. Eh? Me, I'm one of them. So every week you'll find me on a talk show in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, talking about Kenyan politics. When I started doing this back in, the first time I did it was in 2010. When I started doing it in 2010, at that time it was just, you know, something that I did because I was interested in politics. By the time we got to 2013, Kenya had had such tumultuous um, elections in 2012 that I realized God put me there as a voice to calm the people, to calm the nation. I used to walk on set and I say, Holy Spirit, I mute my mind, I mute my spirit. Right now, infest me, think through me. My tongue is yours, use it. Say to the nations what you need to say to the nations. I'd be sitting with a core panelist talking about how there'll be war, it would be worse than 2007. And I would find myself saying, you know what, that's not going to happen. And it would look like I'm commenting about politics, but I'm actually releasing words of prophecy into the atmosphere, canceling the words of darkness and field. People used to say, why are you there? Breakfast, lunch, evening, you're there all the time. It was actually a mandate that I had from God. You need to do this. Anytime they call you, avail yourself. And I would be there all that time. It was a mission field. And I'm telling you, I have seen 
situations changing right before my eyes. Just because you spoke a word, you make people do a double take and you can see the needle changing. I am testament of the fact that God can use you even in ways that look mundane. I have met people in parts of Kenya who told me, we used to wait for you to talk because you knew if you talk, you'll tell us the truth and what you say we can rely on. It's a huge responsibility from, to hear from people. It's huge feedback. But I understood why God created that platform for me, why he gave me this quick motor mouth, why he also gave me a smiley face that people can see on TV and why he gave me a platform to actually go on. Maybe you're not a political commentator, but you're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're a shopkeeper, you're a lecturer. God has given you a sphere of influence. Govern with distinction and with power in that space that he has given you. Govern with excellence as he has commanded you. Apply kingdom principles into that space. Be the change that you want to see. Over and above that, as a society, we have to nurture the next crop of leaders that we want. We have to raise the leaders that we want to see. We have to do right teaching, right standing right now. As believers and as teachers of the word, we have to teach the right doctrine. Mentor the people correctly. Kenya is 82% Christian. You can't tell from the society because people's Christian lives and people's public lives are two separate things. There's something wrong with our doctrine. We need to change it. We need to teach people the correct thing so that the transforming power of Christ can translate into a better society that will demand better of our leaders. That even if they come with their money, we'll tell them your money very should you. We know the right thing and that's what we're standing for. Finally, we need to give the validity of the, of the vote, not just the vote, but values and character. That has to give validity to our leaders. It shouldn't be enough that you're elected. You should be a man of integrity, a woman of integrity who's been elected and that your character has put you in that space. At this juncture, allow me to stop. I love you. God bless you. And thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joy, for such a great um, presentation. Um, there has been a lot uh, to pick out from this and uh, the, the, the Q&A has a number of questions. I'm sure you have a number of questions on our other online platforms as well, um, which we'll be able to address. But, but this has been such an insightful uh, presentation, mostly uh, pointing us to the direction that we need to draw away from, from this um, idea, this ro romanticization that you know, our time is, 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 is coming and yet we are here in the time and we are the ones actually to create um, the future that, that we, we plan to, to achieve. And, and, and this ideological colonization that you talk about is something that I think is, is, is very profound in, 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 in our governance structures today in which we, there's this extroversion, this looking out of Africa for what is out there, not um, what is within. Um, I think the, from the many questions, I think I can just sort of try to confluence and ask you one question, and then the other yeah. questions will be addressed in the breakout rooms. But but this there's there's this uh, break between the, the the old and the new. When you were speaking, you started with uh, a discussion on the colonial, how the colonial affected uh, our, our present dispensation, but but. How, how do we sort of make a reconciliation, for example, between the leaders, the, all the leaders that have uh, stayed in power, for example, and the young people, this emerging huge number of young uh, uh, Africans that is coming up in different countries. How do we find a middle ground between that so that we can formulate a governance model that serves um, both uh, parties? Um, thank you so much for that. Again, I remember what I was talking about worldview. There's also the notion of how young people are rising. And in, in Africa, we keep hearing the criticism of how the old people have hogged the space and there's no more room left for young people. And this becoming part of the friction that is caused between the old and the young. First and foremost, like I said, we still have a foot in our spiritual and cultural past and we have a foot in the future. We need to draw the best of both worlds. If there's one thing that the old people have that young people do not have, they have the foresight of experience. They have seen things that we have not seen. They have been in spaces that we have not been. We need to resist the urge to give in to ageism. Supreme Court judges in the United States serve for as long as they're lucid, as long as they can sit there 
hear a matter and give a decision, they sit. You know why? Because you get to a place in life where you don't care about money, you don't care about your reputation, you just care about doing the right thing and leaving the right space. But here, our judges hit 70 and we tell them to retire and go home. That's just when they're reaching that place where, quite frankly, they don't really care about what all of you think. Their kids are all grown and out. That's when they would actually give us the best service as judges. Mm -hmm. But we gave into ageism and we decided, you know what, people must retire. They must go and make room for the young ones. Now, at the same time, we have to understand that young people have got something to offer. The one thing that young people have that older people don't have is time. So what do you do with the time when you're there? You take time to go through the process. Go take time to go through the learning. Like I said, David went through his years with Saul being taught. He even sat on the, on the throne for 40 years before he finally perceived that he was king. Moses left, was taught in Egypt for the first years of his life. Left there and went, did another 40 years in the wilderness, tending Jethro's sheep before he came into his own. There is a time for process and it takes time to become an excellent leader. But we have been lied to that we can have everything right here, right now. As young people of Africa, we need to resist that urge to skip the process because when we do, we make mistakes and they become costly mistakes. Right now in Africa, we have a youth bulge. We can actually afford to wait out some of these old leaders. And while we wait them out, we take time to make ourselves better. That when it is our turn, what we have seen them do, we will not do because we've taken the time to learn. We can also take the time to unlearn what we have been taught that is no longer beneficial. So for example, when Anand was talking about eight to five jobs we have been shown by Corona is actually, it's nonsense. Everybody's in traffic jam from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. because everybody starts work at 8 a.m. and they have to be physically in the office. Right now we've realized, you know what, we don't have to. We can actually work more efficiently, have a better work-life balance by reimagining things. That will be done when, I mean, you can imagine if I'm the Minister of Labor and I write new laws about how people can work. I would say, you know what, some of those things, we can do away with them and this is how we will do things because we have the benefit of learning innovating and changing. So how do you find that the dichotomy is by respecting people who have paid the price to be where they are, learning the best you can from them. Sometimes they refuse to mentor us, but even if they refuse to mentor, you saw they refuse completely to mentor us, David, but David still learned from him. He still sat there, ducked a few spears, but by the time he was done, by the time he became king, he had learned from Saul how to be king. At the same time, the young people also have to be cognizant of the fact that they are not fallible. Our older people, they are not fallible. In, oh, sorry, they're not infallible, they're fallible. And when they make mistakes, like I said, learn from experience is the best teacher. It just doesn't have to be your own experience. So this would be my answer in how to marry the two. Be running in the truck, getting ready. When it's your turn and you get into the real thing, you run your race and you will do well. Wow, wow, that's 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 great. It reminds me of the Olympic Games in the buttons, pass on the button and and uh, to play your part. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Joy. And uh, I'm sure the people out there that were looking for where do we confluence at this point? The young people, you know, this is the time for you to prepare yourself for for the next stage. And the, the older people as well to mentor these young people so that as we're going into the future, we have learned from our past. And so we are able to create a future that is uh, accounts for both the, 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 those that taught us and for those that will teach and for ourselves as well. Thank you so much, uh, Councilor Joy Amasa. It has been a pleasure. And uh, I'm in, there are some other questions, but we will pick them up in the breakout rooms, uh, or you can answer some in the Q&A um, as the other sessions go on. But thank you so much and um, may God bless you richly.